If you never heard about Coffee from Espírito Santo, please, you are my guest. Right from Sebrae Espírito Santo Studio at International Coffee Week, you're listening to Café. Hello, coffee lovers from all over the world. This is Kelly Stein bringing more news about coffee industry, coffee production here in Brazil. Today, this, this recording is really special because we are recording live from the biggest coffee event in Brazil, maybe from Latin America. It's called International Coffee Week. And this edition is really special because we are hosting four world uh, championship of baristas. So we have Cup Tasters, Brewers Cup, uh, Cup and Good Spirits, and... Latte Art. Latte Art. So we have all the coffee celebrities around. Uh, hanging out with producers, it's really, really cool. And Sebrae Espírito Santo opened their booth for our coffee and our programs. So I'm really honored to, to be here. We are recording live some uh, episodes in English and in Portuguese as well. And today we are going to talk a very specific state called Espírito Santo. Espírito Santo is really uh, known, especially in the international traders, because um, very, uh, some montanhas capixabas and caparó is really uh, famous, but most people didn't understand well what is the Espírito Santo state, or uh, there is much more. That, for this reason, I invited Einstein. How do you say your last name? Veflingsta. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Where are you from? Well, I'm a Norwegian, and uh, I decided to move to Brazil about four years ago to work at Origin. It's really, really cool. Uh, it's an honor to have you here. It was always my intention to in uh, give the invitation, but this guy never stops. He's always Truth on the road. Truth be told, I've been waiting for a while, <laughs> listening to the podcast. I'm so happy. So, uh, first, let's uh, introduce the audience. Who is Aysen? So, you, how long do you work with coffee? Well, I started my first job in coffee back in '98. But I don't really count that date as, as, as the real date because it was only a part-time job. But by the time, I think it was in February in 2000, no, in um, 99 that I started working with coffee full-time. Did you start as a barista? Yes, like most people, yeah. you started as a barista and you gain knowledge and experience and you, and you move on. Of course, you never stop being a barista because it's wonderful. In Norway, you were working where? Uh, know, it, a few companies. Uh, the first one where I did my part-time work and, and got my introduction into coffee doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was a, kind of a special store, meant to be like a, a bit of spice in a normal shopping environment. Uh, we did uh, coffee, tea, uh, we did uh, products for making beer and, and wine at home, spices, all kinds of stuff. But everything related to aroma and, and flavor. Cool. Yeah, it's funny because when you're thinking about international community listening about Brazil, they're not listening all the times. Good news, right? Not and always. So some people, especially during crisis here in Brazil, some people, Brazilian people, say, "What? What you're doing here?" Right? I get that question all the time, and the answer is really simple. Uh, I'm here because it's absolutely amazing. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and you came to work. Why? If you'd like to work in Origin, why Brazil and not other countries? Well, uh, I spent 14 years of my life together with a Brazilian woman. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, there came Brazilian that moment love. when she wanted to go home. I see. So, and and then, of course I grabbed the opportunity because finally... You'd be in Origin. I'd be living in Origin, working at Origin, working directly with producers, working directly with roasteries, working directly with baristas. And do you export nowadays? No, I don't buy any coffee. I don't export any coffee. My work is directly with small roasteries, bringing them up to speed, bringing them up to an international level, or at least trying to. And uh, sometimes I do work with for, for, for cafes that are opening, helping them out in the beginning. Uh, but most of the work is on the roasting and working directly with producers, specifically doing new recipes for, for drying coffees, new recipes for fermentations, uh, getting, so, the, getting the best out of the raw material that we have here. So you're like a complete professional because you're looking inside farms, thinking about post-harvest techniques. I try to do what I know best 
and try not to dip into the agronomy side and leave that to the agronomers because they're specialized in that. It's quite complex. Okay. So you bring the consumer's perspective into the farm and you always uh, do some education programs. If from my side, what is most important to a farmer, every farmer needs to know how to roast samples and they need to know how to cup samples because they need to be independent, they need to have an opinion, they need to know the value of their coffee because the, the market is pretty tough and everyone wants to buy a coffee at the lowest price. And that is... It's not good for the future of coffee. I see. So, uh, when, before coming to Brazil, what, uh, what was your view about Brazilian coffee as a coffee professional? Well, I had the opportunity to, to have some really good Brazilian coffees during the years, but they've been few and usually they don't appear every year. Uh, Brazilian coffee is very focused on production, getting as much or well, getting the production up as much as possible and not too focused on on quality. You see a lot of really good roasteries around the world that they don't buy Brazilian coffee because it's not it's not up to specification. It's not clean enough, it's not interesting enough. But, but that is all changed. that is all changing now. Exactly. And I've seen amazing changes over the last four years. And this is all because there are farmers who know how to roast and cup so they can do their own research they can find their own way and with a little bit of help they can shorten down this this time from maybe you know 10 years of research and development they can make do with three and four and have some amazing results for this reason i decided to start recording in english as well to introduce this new brazil that even brazilian coffee professionals they don't know yet so it's a really exciting change that I can see and we need to communicate. And I thought about you inviting you to talk about Brazilian coffee because you have this international way to understand us. And that's why I would like you to invite you to share this perspective with the international community. So when you arrived, uh, what was the scene here in Brazil? Well, I arrived in Salvador, so it's quite far up north in the country. Hot, humid, yes. good beaches, good food. Um, the first thing I did when I came to Brazil was sleep for a couple of days, <laughs> try to organize all my stuff, and then I headed off for uh, a trip to try to get to know Brazil. So I had a friend of mine from Norway um, that invited me to go visit Minas, so we're in Minas Gerais right now. So she invited me to go see, but luckily enough, I ended up right on the divide between Espirito Santo and Minas. So I got a little bit of both. Oh, so it was your first coffee My trip in here? My first coffee trip in Brazil went straight to Alto Caparao, oh. right on the border with Espirito Santo. So, and this is where I've been hanging out ever since. I see. Just for those who doesn't know, Minas Gerais state today, if Brazil is the biggest coffee producer in the world, Minas Gerais is responsible for produce uh, 60, 60 percent of a Brazilian coffee. So is it that high now? Yes, yes. So if Minas Gerais state was a country, it would be the biggest producer in the world. No, it's kind of fun. There are storehouses of coffees here in Brazil, just one storehouse from one company that have more coffee stored in them than entire countries produce. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's big. It's, it's really big and we have all sorts of coffee. We have commodity, specialty, micro lots, it's really interesting. And where uh, Icing arrived in his first coffee origin, like state, would be in the, how can I say, it's, it was among Minas Gerais and Espirito Santo. It's yeah, really right, nice. Right, right on the border, mountainous region, very cold at night, uh, the climate is very favorable for coffee and well, this mountain goes up almost up to 3,000 meters. Uh, so the climate is very special. And since the mountain is a huge national park, so it's well taken care of, it's nice and clean, the air is good, the soil is good. Um, very favorable. It's like heaven. Very favorable for coffees. Um, our climate is changing a bit, so we're seeing new opportunities in these areas where coffee would not grow before. It's now growing and, and giving really nice coffees. I see. But just 10 years ago, coffee would not grow at this altitude. 
and now it does. In Caparao region, it takes this border, right? So it takes both states of Espiritu Santo and Minas Gerais. Yes, and you have very different climates on the different sides of the mountain. One side is more dry, one side is more wet. Uh, down the south part, it has a good mix of the two. So you can see the profiles of the coffee changes a lot with the climate. One of the things that we see is that when you have much more rainfall, much more humidity in general, the coffees tend to get a lot more acidity. They become a lot more interesting. And in this first uh, trip that he, you arrived in Brazil, Salvador, you organized your stuff, and then you came to this very special corner of coffee. What were your impressions when you arrived as yeah. a coffee professional? No, I landed in, in uh, Vitoria on the, on the coast, hopped on a bus. After about three hours on the bus, coffee started appearing. And I spent another two hours seeing almost nothing but coffee trees. I was in heaven. Yes. It was absolutely amazing. So I passed by the famous uh, producing region of um, uh, Pedra Azul and then passing on to uh, Venda Nova do Imigrante. Climate, soil, fantastic for coffee. Then we're still in Espírito Santo. A bit further on, you get into Minas, even more focused on coffee production. Anywhere you look, there's coffee. You hardly see a cow. There's a lot of Mountains. meat. There's a lot of meat production in in the state, in Espírito Santo, also in Minas. But when you get into this mountainous region, it's almost all coffee. The entire economy is focused on coffee. Coffee is like changing lives of producers over there, right? Absolutely, because in Brazil, contrary to what most people outside of Brazil think they know, uh, almost every single producer of coffee is a very small producer. Yes, there are lots of big farms, but almost all coffee production is made by small producers, families working together. Thanks for mentioning that, because uh, I recorded already an episode called What You Should Know About Brazilian Coffee. It's really interesting. Please, guys, when you finish this conversation, go to the others, because I take all the cliches and paradox, and I will start clarifying, uh, and my guess was Carlos Brando, so it's really interesting. Another thing that I like to talk is people believe that uh, Brazil has only very rich coffee producers, but this is our fault. Yeah, it's our fault. As a Brazilian, because a, a, lot, a lot of them live like I do. You know what do I do when it rains? What? If I'm going to go to sleep and it rains, I have to take a... How do you call that in English? It's been too many years without speaking English. Like a, <laughs> yes. like a baking pan, aluminum pan for, for baking a cake. I take that with me to bed so that when, the, when it rains, my, my roof is leaky. I see. And then I put a small cloth in this thing so it doesn't go... Because then I'll never sleep. So this I way I don't get wet, the bed doesn't get wet, and I get to sleep. Exactly. And a lot of people live like this. It's it's hard to be a producer. There's not a lot of money in it. It has everything has to work for it to pay off. And often you have one good year helping you pay for two or three bad years. So we all need to, you know, band together and, and, and give value to all this hard work that they're doing for us to be able to drink these coffees because it's hard work. And I tell when I go to international events uh, like this in lectures is who has the money to pay marketing? Do the fancy videos with drones are the rich ones but they are not majority so they don't represent the Brazilian reality. So when you arrived here uh, in Caparao region you saw lots of coffee trees and said oh my goodness I can work with coffee in this place, right? Absolutely. And also, it's the, I think it's the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my life. And yeah. by now I know all the back roads and I know where everyone lives. And it's just, the region is just amazing. And uh, coffee-wise, thinking about it, uh, the Espiritu Santo state, it's uh, the, the state which produces lots of canola. Yes, it's a very interesting state because you have, first of all, you have Arabica coffee, but you also have lots of Robusta coffee. The Robusta production is huge, uh, it's very well known. Uh, it's very well known for producing huge quantities at a fairly stable, a very stable quality level. Um, but what we're seeing these days is that we've seen a huge change in the production of, Ara of Arabica coffee. The quality has gone up sky high. It's much, much better than it used to be. And we're also seeing the same thing happening with Robusta now. It's been three years now since I did my first consultancy for a Robusta farmer. And it was, of course, like always, based on roasting, 
and cupping to be able to get the results you need to do to do your own research and be able to produce that coffee that the market is just screaming for but it doesn't exist and they just gained best Robusta coffee here in Brazil and it's awesome I, I'm so happy I, I'm glad to, to you mentioned this because when we, we Brazilians we are talking about this so international people would say oh come on they just want to sell the coffee but you're an international buyer and you can see that the change in quality is coming it's just absolutely unbelievable what they've been able to do with Robusta. Robusta will always be slightly less sweet than a really sweet, beautiful Arabica coffee because it just naturally has less sugars. It is different. Uh, you know, it has, it's like cherries. We yeah. have all sort of cherries, I right? Mean, there's, there's more of a difference if I don't get this, if I get this wrong, please excuse me, but there's more of a difference between Robusta and Arabica than there is between a fly and a human. <laughs> You know, one has 22 chromosomes, the other one has 44. It's, it's, exactly. It's exactly. very, very, very different. And it's uh, a very curious fact about this state. Spirit Sunday produced lot, lots of robust and conilon, especially conilon. And there was a huge drought that hit this state, I don't know, two years ago. It's been a bit more than that because they've hardly seen a drop of rain for about five years. It's very difficult. I know, but there was a huge crisis, especially with the prices. So yeah. all the industry needed even bad quality conilon or robusta, and they didn't have it because they didn't have rain. So it was the first time that I saw conilon be higher price than Arabica. Yes. This was really weird, but at the same time cool. It was. <laughs> I mean, the last time I was there was right at the end of the harvest. Um, it's been a little while now because I've been busy with other projects and they've been doing it so well on their own that I haven't had to go back and help them. So okay. that's, that's, that's the best possible outcome because that means I can focus on other people who also need to get better. Exactly. I don't, like, I don't like going back to the same producer time and time again. The, the idea is to prepare them to do all their own work so that they can be, they can be free. Exactly. Free of people putting price on their coffee free from people telling them what their coffee is worth, that it's not good. It's, yeah, it's really interesting. And then, right after this curious fact, uh, Conilon producers, they start to organize themselves and now they are trying, working to, to launch their origin. Yes. And I would like to know your opinion about that and how do you, do you think we will find buyers for this uh, high quality Conilon? Absolutely. Uh, the coffee will be expensive because it's expensive to produce, just like any other coffee that is, gets really, really good. Sometimes you get lucky, but usually it's a question of, of skill. And applying complicated processes to the drying, the fermentation, and most of the work has to be done manually, so it takes time, it's expensive. You can't really get around it. To get a really, really high quality coffee, it needs to be hand sorted, hand picked one by one. Then it has to be resorted and resorted. And a lot of these small farms at the end, after milling the coffee, they, they don't have any machine to help them get this coffee up to the level it needs to be. So it's actually at the very end before it's bagged and ready to be shipped off, you actually have to hand pick the whole lot, bean by bean. So this is one of the reasons why coffee gets really expensive sometimes, but it's also the reason why the coffee becomes so good. incredibly good. Yes, yes. This is not an episode about Conilon. If you're curious to learn more about, I also recorded another episode with Silvio Leach in English called Specialty Conilon and Robusta, showing that this exists. So I invite you guys to listen to that. And let's talk about the other uh, very specific place called Montanhas do Espírito Santo, Espírito Santo Mountains. Have you ever been there? Can you, how do you describe the, the region? Well, first of all, it's exceptionally beautiful. Uh, the roads are decent, so you can uh, get around quite easily. Of course, there's lots of dirt roads. You have to kind of hit the dirt roads to, <laughs> to not lose too much time, make some shortcuts. It doesn't always work out. Sometimes you just, I don't know, I've had water half my car submerged in water several times trying to get to where I need to go. But it's normal, come on, you're going to farm. No, I'm from a cold place, I'm used to snow, I'm used oh, to ice, that's true. but <laughs> there is nothing worse on this planet for driving than, you know, 15 centimeters of really wet mud. True. It's impossible. And slippery, yes. Yeah. And 
what about the coffees over there? Most of the, the those producers are, are small. Are, how many hectares on average? I really wouldn't know because that's not the most common measure. Uh, we usually talk about how many bags you produce per year as a, as a mean production because it goes up and down a lot. Let's say I have a really good friend of mine from further up north in Bahia and in a bad year he'll make 60 bags. In a good year he'll make 150. I see. So it depends on rainfall, it depends on how well you treat and, and, and nourish your trees. Lots of factors. Uh, rain at the right time. I see. Drought at the right time because the coffee it's also needs exactly. the coffee needs to needs to pass through a, a period of, of drought to be able to produce really good coffee, but it also needs rain at the correct moment. Yes, and what I can tell, the average of uh, Brazilian producers they they have minimum one hectare to seven hectare. This is what we consider small. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty different when we compare to the Ethiopian reality, because in Ethiopia, in Ethiopia they are counting the trees, not hectares, right? <laughs> and in Colombia they are talking about, I don't know. I think there are some some properties they have one hectare because it's really mountain. Well, I know producers who produce two bags a year. True. Do we have this in Brazil? Yes, absolutely. You see, guys. Brazil is huge and it can hold and engage all sort of profiles. What do you think for uh, in the future is the challenge for the Brazilian coffee? The future will bring us lots of good stuff, first of all. Uh, it's looking really bright, it's looking really nice. Um, the economy is always a big question on what will be possible to do the way the economy is right now and where are we going. But what we're seeing is that information is spreading so much faster. Uh, it looks like people are finally starting to be able to make use of the internet in a more intelligent way. I see. Getting information, trading information between producers in different countries. Um, to tell their stories as tell well. Tell their stories. Uh, one of the things that is most difficult in Brazil is the fault of having a good reference. Because we don't have coffee from abroad here. If we do, it's been roasted abroad, it gets here, it's already old. So a lot of people, this includes baristas, it includes farmers, it includes most everyone. There's a, there's a, there's a, we're missing reference points to be able to see what we actually have. And yeah. also, in Brazil, we have something going that's not the best thing for the country. And a lot of people think, seem to think that everything from abroad is better. And I tend to disagree. Yes, it's a cultural We paradigm. have to put yeah. value on what we produce, what we have here. We have to show off what we have because the world doesn't know Brazil. The world knows the old Brazil, volume production. Yes. And... For no, that's why coffee exists in English. For me, it's a challenge to be recording in English. So, but I think the most important thing is to tell, take ownership of our narrative. And, Absolutely. Yeah, and producers are starting to pay attention to that as well. Say, so, okay, I am already doing specialty. How do I sell and how do I communicate this special product? Do you have any tips for international buyers, baristas who would like to come to Brazil oh, yes. and explore I have, a very, I have a very hot tip. What? So, buyers, green buyers, they come to Brazil in August and September to buy coffee. You guys are missing all the good coffees. How come? Because Brazil is vast, it's huge, it has different climatic zones. Um, there are coffees that are ready to be picked, that are on the patios drying in April. And there are coffees that are drying on the patios in, at the end of December. And depending on the region, every region has its, let's, let's call it a, a slightly different flavor. Uh, it's a simplified view, it's a bit of an old view, but there's a lot of regions, mountains regions, where it's cold, it's very favorable for coffee. Uh, the production is all done by hand because that's what the economy allows. Uh, it's all done in small lots with a lot of patience, a lot of love, focus on quality, and these coffees are only ready for sale in the end of November, December, January. These, especially in Espirito Santo. Yeah, mountains. especially in Espirito Santo, right on the border with Minas. This is a region that is absolutely incredible. And the soil, 
it's the climate. Uh, it, everything comes together to make coffees that nobody will believe that these, these coffees are from Brazil. This is my focus for the fair, because at this fair, I've been responsible for the coffee for La Marzocco. Okay. So I spent about three weeks working with the best producers I know from Espírito Santo and right across the border into Minas. But my focus has been Espírito Santo, because they're very interesting, they're very good, they're very juicy. Very a different. lot of acidity, you know, the coffees that I've been serving, both as espresso and as drip coffee with uh, with La Marzocco here during the fair, you know, everyone keeps asking me, so is this an Ethiopia, is this a Kenya? It's like, no, it's a Brazil. It's like, are, you, are, you, are you serious? Yes. Just give me a second, I'll call the producer. We can talk. And having someone, having the producers here, hanging was... around at the stand to help them sell their coffees, show off what they have. It's like, sorry, this one is already gone now, but we can we can make the same one for you next year because I've actually seen flavor profiles that they managed to copy almost 100% from one year to the other. So what we're starting to understand here that a lot of people in other countries have understood for a little longer is that processing is everything. Yes, you have to have good genetics, you have to have the climate, you need to have, you need to have water, you need to take care of your, of your trees, but the producer makes the coffee on the drying patio. Would you advise these international green coffee buyers or even baristas uh, to start squeezing their traders to get different and look for more different profiles of Brazilian coffees? I would tell them to come here and find somebody local that can help them get around. Oh my and goodness! And see all now? these places that nobody knows where it is. Exactly. I've been doing this for four years now and I'm starting to know a lot of good producers. I focus on the small ones. <laughs> it's kind of stupid because I run a business, but I focus on the people who don't, can't afford to pay me. <laughs> Come on, no, you're doing good. Thank you for doing that and being this bridge with the international community. Now you're in trouble because I will leave in the website of this episode your email. Uh -oh. So, yes, guys, <laughs> now it's recorded, you're in trouble. No. Um, it's really funny you're talking about late harvest. People yes. are harvesting some coffees in December here in Brazil, in Espírito Santo, and most of people not even imagine that happened. I will give an example. Last year I was at a Cup of Excellence, which was in Venda Nova do Migrante. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to go there, but my schedule is so full. I know. <laughs> And it was really funny because during the ceremony, award ceremony to review the champions, uh, Susie Splinter, she's one of the responsible yeah, of Cup of Excellence. Hi, Susan, I want to record with you. Um, she, she gave a really powerful speech. I want more Spirit to Sun to growers uh, participating in this award and blah, blah, blah. No, and she's a power bank. She's been transforming the industry for a lot of years. Without her, we wouldn't be where we are today. There's a, there's a bunch of other really strong, really important people. Yes. And uh, we have Sunalini from India. This oh, big role inspiring. model for me. Yes. Very inspiring. I'm glad because they are women in coffee, women in coffee. And you... She taught me how to pour water for cupping back in 2000 and was it uh, 2002 or something at the World Championships in Oslo. Wow. I'm so lucky. Yes, you are. <laughs> and then I went to India to visit her. Even cool. better. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Just, so just coming back, she gave us, Susie, she gave this powerful speech, and one producer asked her the right to talk. And then he said, you know what? We would like to be part of this award, but our coffee are still on the trees. So we cannot be at Cup of Excellence. So they did a special award. Yes, that was amazing. The... Did you see that? Did you try those coffees? Yes. Oh my goodness. Finally, we had a market for these really, 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 really late harvest coffees. So this is the Destaque Brasil, né? Yes. So basically, yes. Let's, let's simplify it like show off Brazil. <laughs> yes. And who won? Somebody I've been working with tightly for three years. Really? Who? Oh, you give names. So there's this place called um, Sitio Alegria in Espírito Santo, uh, the biggest municipality in this mountainous region. It's a huge, it's not the biggest municipality, but it's the biggest producer of coffee. I so see. there's a small family there um, mom and dad, Rosa, De Naval, and, and a bunch of kids. They. Uh, run the farm pretty much all by themselves. A little bit of help during picking, but it's basically five people 
uh, working all uh, now there's six but this is also a beautiful young wife of one of the sons that are helping out a lot she really does amazing picking they're masters of fermentation they're really good on drying and i have their coffee at the stand uh, so they they won uh, another guy that i really admire a young man called derio Briosk from Vendanova, yes. which is close to there, also yes. Espiritu Santo. He got the po- coffee that got the highest uh, score, but this contest was based on the s- money the coffee was bringing in. So one was actually slightly better, but maybe the o- other coffee was slightly more interesting. So it's not all about points, there's also personality involved. Exactly, yes, personality. Which was completely which is, different. Th- and this is one of the biggest problems that Brazil has, personality of the coffee. Because if you look at the coffee production in Brazil in general, uh, it's all based on a very small number of varietals. There's Catuai, there's Mundo Novo. Bourbon. There's some Bourbon, but not too much. And if you look at the general production, that's pretty much all of it. So this is one of the reasons why for so many years Brazil coffee has been tasting like Brazil coffee. It's been almost difficult, you know, seeing what's different from region to region. Thank you for saying that, yes. And this kind of, when a producer stood up and said, we have very late, late harvest and we cannot be in this award. So BSA decided to, let's think about Uh, award, uh, quality contents for those who cannot be here with us today, and it was really nice. It was fantastic. It was a beautiful first trial, and I hope that this program will continue for a yeah, long it time. It will, it will. Just like this, this uh, International Coffee Week, because it used to be in September. True. And we were missing all the good coffees. No, of course there was lots of good coffee, but, you know, so many coffees would not make it. And then they moved it to October. It helped. And November. Now it's in November. It's yes. starting to get pretty good. Yes, you're right. Next year, maybe we'll do it for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> to sum up um, our conversation, do you, would you like to share some knowledge, tips or advice for international community who wants to get and know these very unique coffees, especially from Espiritu Santo? Well, first of all, you have to come here and you have to come here at the right time. So you need to do your research, you need to talk to people, you need to send emails. Um, if you need some help, send me an email. I um, can help as well. If you look at my Instagram, my telephone number is there. It's probably a stupid thing to do. but <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> It's even stupider to say out loud. Um, and record it. Because <laughs> what we need is progress. What we need is to move forward. What we need is to share information. And, and grow together. This will always only be possible if we work together. It has to be open, it has to be done with respect.